Chapter 6, it's about the integumentary system. The integumentary system has several structures that are usually inspected during a physical exam. Such structures are the skin, hair, nails, and the associated glands of the skin. The skin itself is the most vulnerable organ in our body because it's in constant contact with the environment and this skin can be exposed to physical and chemical agents that it can injure the skin. Such agents are radiation, trauma, infection, and chemicals. The skin is known to receive more medical uh, treatment than any other organ system. And dermatology is the branch of medicine that deals with the diagnosis and medical treatment for diseases of the integumentary system. So, the integumentary system in general consists of the skin and the accessory organs, such as the hair, nails, and cutaneous glands, including the mammary gland, which is part of the integumentary system. Characteristics of the skin is that it is the largest and heaviest organ in our body. It can range between 1.5 to 2 square, st square meters of uh, surface area, and it makes 15% of the body weight. Like if someone weighs 10, 100 pounds, uh, 15 pounds will be skin. The skin has two layers. The most superficial layer, which is the epidermis, epi means above and then the underlying dermis which is part of the skin now the epidermis is composed of several layers of cells that are flat or scaly so it is a stratified squamous epithelium and the dermis is a deep connective tissue now hypodermis is not part of the skin but it is usually studied together with the skin and it's just found beneath the dermis, the dermis sorry, and it has a lot of medical importance. Now, hypodermis, the other name will be subcutaneous fat. Our skin uh, varies in thickness depending on the area of the body that you can uh, study. So <clears throat> it can range between 0.5 to six millimeters, uh, one of the uh, areas of our body where we have uh, the most thin skin or epidermis will be within the eyelids. And one of the areas of our body where we have the thickest, thickest uh, skin will be within the back of our body in between the scapula. So we have two types of uh, skin. So we have one that is called thick skin, that it is located within the hands, in the palms, and also in the soles of our feet. This skin, it doesn't have sweat glands, it doesn't have uh, hair follicles or sebaceous oil glands. And the epidermis in here measures 0.5 millimeters of thickness. Thin skin covers the rest of the body. It has hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands. And the epidermis <clears throat> in thin skin is five times uh, less thicker than the thick skin, so it's only 0.1 millimeters of thickness in the thin skin. So this is the figure to show you the two major layers of the skin, which is the epidermis, all this, the most superficial one, and then the dermis, which is the thickest and the most deep structure. Now within the epidermis, again, we have stratified squamous epithelium. And then within the dermis, we have connective tissue, dense connective tissue. And within this dermis, we have several structures like the accessory glands, including hair, the uh, corpuscles uh, or receptors for our skin, so we can have sensitivity, 
also muscles like in this case the pillar erector muscle that it is associated with the hair uh, root also we have a lot of blood vessels and we have uh, sweat glands and sebaceous glands so functions of the skin will be to resist to trauma and infections we have uh, this inert layer in the skin that is made out of a tough protein which is called keratin that protect us from invasion of microorganisms and also within the skin some cells produces these uh, antimicrobial substances which are dermacidine and defensins that kills Inv invasive uh, microorganisms. Now we have normal flora or normal number of microorganisms within our skin, but these ones will secrete this acid mantle in order to prevent the overgrowth of bacteria that can harm us. Now other functions will be to act as a barrier because since it has this keratin layer, it prevents from us from losing water or absorbing too much water. Also, it protects us from the natural UV radiation because we have cells within the skin that absorbs this UV, ra UV radiation or ultraviolet radiation. And also, it protects us from the entry of harmful chemicals. Now, within the skin, we start the synthesis of vitamin D by the conversion of some cholesterol molecules in our skin into the inactive form of vitamin D. And then the liver and the kidneys will uh, start completing this process of the synthesis of vitamin D. The skin is also an organ for sensation. So we have uh, nerve endings within the skin that can detect changes in temperature so we can tell when an object is hot or cold also when we touch an object we can tell if it's rough or if it's smooth also uh, we can detect uh, harmful uh, stimuli that we interpret as pain so we have uh, several receptors including for uh, vibration now our skin also help us to regulate temperature so we have receptors that can detect uh, the environment uh, temperature and then when it's cold we start constricting the blood vessels in our dermis so we can have less blood flow within that part of the skin and we can preserve heat for our body now we do the opposite when it's uh, hot so we vasodilate or we increase the diameter of the blood vessels and as the blood is flowing through our skin, we can dissipate heat. Now through perspiration, which is at some point um, evaporation of, of water, we can cool also our, our body. Now our skin is also part of uh, the nonverbal communication because many of these muscles of the face, the facial muscles, insert into the dermis and at some point whenever we have uh, certain emotions we can show it through our facial expressions and also uh, our skin is part of uh, being so socially accepted and uh, for some people to have uh, self-esteem or self-image Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now let's talk about the epidermis. So the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin. So it has this uh, series of layers in which you have some cells on the most superficial layer of the skin that are dead. And these dead cells are packed with keratin which is a protein that is very tough that prevents us from over uh, losing water or gaining water. So it, it basically maintains a specific amount of hydration in our body. Now, as any other 
epithelia, the epidermis doesn't have its own blood supply, so it's a vascular. And where does the epidermis get its nutrients? From the dermis. Now, uh, within the most internal layer of the epidermis, we have nerve endings that help us to detect changes in touch, superficial touch and pain. So within the epidermis, we have five cell types. So from the most internal layer or of our epidermis, which is known as the stratum basale, we have the stem cells. Stem cells in our body, no matter where they are located, one of the functions will be to replace cells that are damaged or that have died. So <clears throat> these stem cells are known because they are the undifferentiated and when they need to replace other cells, they start replicating by mitosis and then they mi migrate from the most deep layer of the epidermis into further superficial layers. Now these stratum basale cells, these stem cells, have this cuboidal to low columnar shape. And in between these stem cells, we have these melanocytes, which are cells that produces melanin. This is a pigment that absorbs UV light and prevents the other cells that are surrounding it from getting damaged because UV light, as it is penetrating into other cells, it can break, make breaks and mutations within the DNA and that can lead to cancer. Now the melanocytes, the aspect is that they have uh, this star-like shape so they extend these uh, pr processes and then they start sometimes secreting the melanin as they are uh, located within these cells. Now the major cell type that we have within the epidermis will be the keratinocytes, which is the cells that produces the keratin. Within the skin, we also have tactile cells of different kinds, which are touch receptors. And these touch receptors can be for fine touch or crude touch or rough touch. And these tactile cells within the epidermis are located specifically at the base or the deepest layer of the epidermis. And also within the epidermis, Ha we have some cells that are macrophages that helps to eat up debris or to attack microorganisms that are known as dendritic cells. These dendritic cells come from the bone marrow and they migrate into the skin and then they extend also the, the cytoplasm. They look like a star shape and then they prevent many damage to our skin, especially from pathogens. Now, specifically, the dendritic cells are found in between two layers of the epidermis, or sorry, within two layers of the epidermis that are known as stratum espinosum and stratum granulosum. So, this is the composition of the epidermis. So, within the epidermis, we have this is stratum basale. This is the most deeper layer. Within this deeper layer, we have these stem cells that are undifferentiated cells that are going to undergo mitosis when they need to replace the cells here on the surface that have uh, undergo injury or they have died. Now, within the stratum basale, we also have these melanocytes that has long, long extensions and they secrete granules of pigment that we know as melanin. This melanin will protect our uh, other cells from the skin from UV damage. Now the next uh, layer 
of the skin is going to be called a stratum espinosum. Now the stratum espinosum is made by many layers of keratinocytes. These will be the keratinocytes. And these typically, these keratinocytes will shrunken when you take a biopsy of the skin, you put it in a fixative agent like alcohol or uh, formaldehyde, and these cells will shrink, form a spiny look shape that's its characteristic, and that's why they put it, the name to this stratum or this layer as a stratum espinosum because it looks like a spiny layer. Now these keratinocytes are hold to each other by these desmosomes. This will be the connections of the keratinocytes. So this is the stratum espinosum. Now within the stratum espinosum, we not only have these keratinocytes, but also we have these dendritic cells, which are the macrophages of the skin. So if a microorganism that uh, it is located within their environment enters into a wound if on our skin and it tries to invade going into the uh, basal layer of the epidermis and then into the underlying dermis, these dendritic cells will attack these microorganisms. So uh, the next layer, it is the stratum granulosum. It's two to five layers of cells that has this cytoplasm with this chemical that we know as keratohyaline. And this forms like little granules, this keratohyaline, and it is giving this aspect of if they were uh, grainy substances inside the cell. So that's why this one is called the stratum granulosum. Now, only in thick skin, we have this other layer, which is, this, which is called the stratum lucidum. This will be a clear zone that it is very narrow and it doesn't have any specific feature. Now, within this <coughs> uh, thin skin, then we don't have uh, that layer, the, the uh, stratum lucidum, but we have it within this uh, thick skin. Now the stratum lucidum has this densely packed clear protein that is known uh, that is known as elatin. And then we have the stratum corneum which is up to 30 layers of uh, cells, keratinocytes that are dead and they are packed with this keratin and this gives this uh, skin the property of being resistant to abrasion, penetration and dehydration. So those are the strata or layers in the cell types of the epidermis. So uh, thin skin has only four layers. Thick skin has five layers. So from the most deep to the superficial, they are the following. So the stratum basale, it is the most deep epidermal layer. It has, as I told you before, the stem cells and also has some keratinocytes and melanocytes and tactile cells as well. Now, as the stem cells are dividing, they push the upper layers up and then we start replacing the cells that have died at the surface of the skin. The stratum espinosum I told you already how they take its name and uh, it has a lot of layers. So this is the thickest layer and in the thin skin. And it not only has the desmosomes, but also has tight junctions that prevents as well the uh, over loss of water or dehydration. The strong granulosum is thin three to five layers of the keratinocyte. He has these granules of keratohyaline, that's why it's called stratum granulosum. And then the elatin is found in uh, thick skin. Uh, it's uh, within, found within the stratum lucidum. Stratum corneum, 
up to 30 layers of dead skin as I already mentioned and it helps to prevent the skin from abrading uh, penetration and water loss. This is the view, microscopic view of the layers of the skin. So from the deepest to the uh, superficial layer. So this will be the stratum basale, all of these in here, the first layer, and then all of these will be the stratum espinosum. And this, where you see this dark portion, is where you have the granules of keratohyaline. So this is the stratum granulosum. And then we have these 20 to 30 layers of dead cells which are cells that are basically pouches or sacs of keratin, this will be the stratum corneum. And then if this was a sample of thick skin, in here you will find the stratum lucidum. And then of course underneath we will have the dermis in here. So if you magnify uh, some of these layers, of the thin skin. This uh, might be a thin skin from the eyelids perhaps because as you see it's more thinner than usual. You have the uh, dermis in here, you have the stratum basale here, and it's very hard to find where you have here the stratum granulosum and where you have the stratum espinosum, but this is uh, keratin for sure of the stratum corneum. Okay, so where does the keratinocytes come from? Well, it comes from cell division of the stem cells. So when the stem cells on the stratum basale of the skin undergo mitosis, they produce two, two cells. One that is going to become a stem cell and another cell that is going to become a keratinocyte. And then uh, these stem cells are constantly replacing the dead cells that we have in the surface in the stratum corneum of our skin. So you have very live mitosis within this stratum basale helping to replace all these dead cells. So it takes between 30 to 40 days for a keratinocyte uh, to migrate from a stratum basale up to stratum corneum. Now, because of this high rate of mitosis of the stem cells, the stem cells in the stratum basale depend so much on the nutrients and oxygens that the underlying dermis can give. Now, as we age, of course, not only the cells of our skin, but the cells everywhere in our body undergo mitosis as, at a slower rate. So these 30 to 40 days might be for a young person uh, to replace these keratinocytes, but for us sometimes as we age might take possibly up to two months. And uh, when someone has an injury or stress in the skin, uh, this replacement uh, or mitosis in the skin undergoes much rapidly. Uh, one example is when you form calluses or corns in your skin. Okay, uh, this is because you are putting so much pressure on your skin and as a mechanism of defense, you uh, keep some of these dead keratinocytes. Okay, so uh, we have uh, then four important events that happens in the stratum granulosum. So uh, these uh, cells in the stratum granulosum, these keratinocytes, will have these keratohyaline granules that will release a protein that is called filaggrin. And this filaggrin will bind to keratin and then it forms these tough bundles. And these cells will start to produce these tough envelopes of proteins beneath their membranes. And these will help together with the release of lipids to spread out over the cell surface and waterproof these keratinocytes. And then 
the keratinocytes under the uh, pressure of this protein in these lipids will start uh, receiving less oxygenation and this will kill these keratinocytes and the organelles of course will die and then you form this epidermal water barrier that is made by these dead keratinocytes and this uh, it helps us to prevent dehydration and overabsorption of water now sometimes uh, when we put our uh, hands or our feet so much in water we will absorb uh, water but only up to the level of the stratum corneum the stratum granulosum is waterproof okay now let's talk about characteristics of the dermis so the dermis is connective tissue that it is found beneath the epidermis and this dermis it has a lot of vascular supply and also it has a lot of nerve endings now the thickness of the dermis ranges between 0.2 in the eyelids to 4 millimeters in the palms and the soles now this uh, connective tissue that we have in the dermis is dense so it has majorly collagen fibers and uh, as I told you before, it has a lot of blood supply and also it has a lot of sweat glands, sebaceous glands, nerve endings, and the hair follicles and na nail roots, of course, in our uh, fingers and our toes. Now, uh, <clears throat> within the dermis, we not only have these collagen fibers, but also we have elastic fibers and also we have reticular fibers. Now, these elastic fibers is what it gives this uh, flexibility to the dermis and also its resilience as we age these elastic fibers start being produced less or they get lost much easier and our dermis become less flexible and it starts breaking and it starts forming these uh, wrinkles that we don't like now Within the dermis uh, of our face, we attach skeletal muscles. And it has this wavy shape that it's connected to the epidermis forming this uh, papillae that goes upward like if it was, were fingers. And then the epidermal ridges, the fingers that goes down from the epidermis connects to the dermis and they form a strong boundary uh, or sorry a, a strong connection in which you have more surface area preventing the detachment of the epidermis from the dermis in some areas of our body we will have uh, these epidermal ridges uh, more prominent and these will form the fingerprints So the dermis has two major layers. The most superficial is called papillary because it extends these finger-like projections. Papilla will be kind of uh, another name for fingers. And then the deeper layer will be the reticular layer. Now within the papillary layer, we have a real connective tissue very close to the extensions of the dermis that are called the derma papilla. And this loose connective tissue, this areolar tissue, will help for the entry of leukocytes from the, the blood vessels, escaping from the blood vessels and other cells like the macrophages, just in case that a microorganism has entered into the dermis. And of course, these papillary layers is reaching small blood vessels. So you have a lot of blood supply to this area because it's that closest to the epidermis and the epidermis since it doesn't have its own blood supply the dermis through the papillary layer gives these uh, nutrients and oxygen to the epidermal cells now the reticular layer is the deepest layer of the dermis and is the thickest layer it has uh, dense irregular connective tissue and is made out of mainly of collagen fibers and uh, also has some degree of 
adipose tissue. And these fibers, these collagen fibers, when they break, uh, for instance, in some people, not in all, but when a female is pregnant or when someone gains so much weight, these uh, layers or, or these uh, collagen fibers can break and they can form stretch marks, stretch marks that we known as estriae. So this is the microscopy of the dermis. So this will be the papilla, the extensions that look like fingers. And these parts of the corresponding parts of the epidermis, this will be the epidermal ridges or retepex, that's another name. Now this, uh, if you magnify this area of the papilla, uh, you can see that you have areolar tissue. So areolar tissue has a lot of reticular and elastic fibers. And in here you have also a lot of blood supply that helps to nourish these uh, deeper layers of the epidermis. Now, if you take a sample of this layer of the dermis, so this is the papillary dermis, this is the reticular dermis, and if you magnify it, these magnifications are with the scanning electron well, transmission electron micrograph, uh, you have uh, these tough collagen fibers. You also have the other fibers, but the most abundant will be the uh, collagen fibers. Okay, so again, hypodermis, it is not part of the skin, but we considered uh, during the chapter for this, the integumentary system or the segment of the skin because it's just beneath the skin. So it is subcutaneous, the other name is subcutaneous tissue. And in here we have uh, areolar connective tissue, including adipose tissue, which is areolar. So <clears throat> this hypodermis provides a pad to help the skin to bind to the underlying tissues. And it's the site where someone can have a hypodermal injection because it has a lot of blood supply. Now, within the hypodermis, since we have this adipose tissue or subcutaneous fat, this hypodermis serves as an energy reservoir, also helps to provide thermal insulation. So uh, when it's cold, uh, we can have this thermal insulation. And usually it's thicker in women in areas of our body like uh, the pelvis, uh, like uh, in the side of the hips and also in her breast and is thinner in the infants and in the elderly. So again, this is just to see uh, what are the structures of our skin. So we have here the epidermis and its different layers. So here we have the dermal papillae of the uh, dermal uh, of the papillary layer of the dermis. And also here we have the reticular layer of the epidermis with uh, its different uh, structures like tactile corpuscles, uh, this uh, lamellar pachinian corpuscle, which is a pressure receptor. Also we have these sensory fibers that are hair receptors. Here we have the hair root we have a sweat gland, a sal uh, sebaceous gland, erector pili muscle, and then all these uh, net of capillaries that provides blood supply to these papillary ridges on the dermis. And also we have this blood supply here within the hypodermis. Okay, now let's talk about uh, skin color. So the skin color, it is produced by melanin, one of these pigments that we have within our skin. Now the melanin is produced by the melanocytes that are scattered within the stratum basale. And these melanocytes, as they are releasing melanin granules, these melanin granules can accumulate in the keratinocytes. Now we have two forms of this melanin. We have one that 
it is called eumelanin, that it is found in uh, persons who have brown or black color more abundantly. And then we have this pheomelanin, which is uh, a reddish to yellow pigment that it has sulfur in it, that it is found more in people with uh, lighter colors of skin. Now, we all have the same number of melanocytes, but the type and the, uh, and the amount of uh, melanin that it is released by these melanocytes is what it gives this uh, different color to the skins. Now, at some point, when someone get exposed to uh, UV radiation because the person it is uh, exposed to the uh, environment, to the sun, or when someone goes to tan, this person will start activating these cells to produce more melanin. So in darker skinned people, uh, the, the melanocytes will produce more melanin and the melanin will be more resistant to breaking down. And this melanin will spread out in between the keratinocyte cells layers and you can see uh, some melanized cells throughout the epidermis. In lighter skinned people, the melanin will be clumped near to the keratinocyte nucleus, so it, it doesn't uh, absorb so much UV light, and then it won't show the light in these persons as dark. Now, uh, <clears throat> they will find then, uh, you will find then in people with lighter skin color that there is very little melanin, and the melanin is usually found at the first layers of the skin, or sorry, the epidermis, which is uh, within the stratum basale. So here is uh, the histology for light skin and dark skin. So in here, you find this uh, pigment, the, the melanin within the stratum basale, and sometimes going up here into the stratum granulosum. And then in here, you can find very little melanin in light skin in the stratum basale. So again, if someone exposes to UV light, no matter if it's natural or artificial, the person stimulates the secretion of melanin by the melanocytes and that will darken the skin. Now we can have other pigments, of course, that can influence skin color. So uh, some pigments will be hemoglobin, the pigment in uh, the uh, red blood cells, which adds reddish to pinkish hue to the skin. And then we have keratin, which is a yellow pigment that is found in yellow orange uh, vegetables or in egg yolks that will concentrate in the stratum corneum and in the subcutaneous fat. Okay, so before uh, we continue, let me give you the five key points for for this uh, this chapter. Uh, some of these key points, uh, just to to let you know, uh, it will make more sense toward the end of the lecture because that's when we're going to talk about some of these uh, concepts. But here you go. So uh, one of the things that uh, can be noticed during the inspection of the skin is the different uh, aspects of the skin. So when someone has a bluish tone in the skin, this is known as cyanosis because the person lacks oxygen. So the name of the bluish tone, this is the first key point, the name of the bluish tone in skin when someone lacks oxygen is cyanosis. The next uh, key point. So the protein in the skin that helps to prevent dehydration in the skin surface is keratin. That was the second key point. Now, uh, functions of the skin, this is the third key key point. So uh, functions of the skin will be to regulate body temperature, to excrete uh, sodium chloride and wastes, to provide tactile sensation, and protect underlying 
tissues and to produce vitamin D. So these are again the functions of the skin, regulate body temperature, excrete wastes and sodium chloride, provide tactile sensation and protection to the underlying tissues and synthesize vitamin D. Now, uh, given this is the third key point, given that there, there are stem cells in the basal layers undergo mitosis constantly, which tissue can regenerate and repair itself much easily? Epithelial tissue, that's the answer. So epithelial tissue can regenerate and repair itself much easily than nervous tissue, muscle tissue, and connective tissue. So basically, what is the most active tissue that can repair and regenerate very easily? Epithelial tissue. That was kind of a point from uh, last chapter and this chapter. Now, another uh, key point. It's about uh, these skin burns. So there is this second degree skin burn in which when someone is cleaning a burn area of second degree, the skin hair follicles get detached in this person. So if you're cleaning a wound in someone who has had this second degree burn, the hair follicles will detach. And I will reemphasize this uh, when we reach it to the skin burn uh, part. Okay, so then the tone of our skin can give diagnostic value. So if someone is lacking oxygen because the person is choking or the person has cardiac failure, the person will have a bluish tone this is known as cyanosis. Now, sometimes you can have an inflammation in the skin, and this is known as erythema because you have increased blood flow to the skin. Now, if someone has low blood supply to their skin, the person will have pallor. And this can be due to uh, someone having anemia, for instance. Albinism, it's uh, genetic. Uh, condition of the skin in which the person will have uh, sometimes patches in the skin that are much uh, lighter in color than the rest of the skin. Now uh, jaundice is the yellowish tint of the skin due to accumulation of pigments like bilirubin that it can pinpoint to a problem in the function of the liver. And accumulation of blood under the skin is known as hematoma or a bruise. We have uh, some skin marks like uh, friction ridges that uh, are markings that are found within the fingertips that leave oily uh, fingerprints on the surface we touch. And we all have our own fingerprinting or fingerprints, sorry, and not even identical twins have the same uh, fingerprints. And one of the function of these uh, friction ridges, although they might not be so deep as you might think, but it, it helps us to uh, to grab objects, okay, to manipulate the environment. And also, we can have in some areas of the skin, like in our palms, also in our soles. Uh, and even in the uh, for arms, arms, we, we can have these flexion creases or flexion lines. And uh, the skin bound in here, the skin is bound to deeper tissues along these lines. Also, we can have accumulation of melanocytes in certain areas, and this can be known as freckles or moles. Uh, freckles are flat, uh, moles are elevated. And sometimes moles can have hair in it. And then when someone has um, these navy or moles, the person has to make sure that there is no sudden change in color diameter 
and contour of these moles because if this happens, this may suggest that the person might have a cancer in the skin. And then uh, we have different types of hemat hemangiomas, which are also known as birthmarks, in which uh, you can have uh, patches of discolored skin caused by uh, some benign tumors of the capillaries in the dermis. And they usually disappear at a specific age within childhood and others will last for life. Uh, some of the examples of the ones that disappears uh, within the first uh, two years of life will be the capillary hemangiomas. Other ones like the cavernous hemangiomas, uh, they can disappear up to uh, the first decade of life. And then sometimes these uh, birthmarks can stay uh, from uh, in the entire life, like in the case of port wine stain, in which actually you can see a reddish uh, patch, usually within the face of the person or the forehead. Okay, now let's talk about the accessory glands. So uh, accessory glands of the integumentary system will be the hair, or sorry, accessory structures, will be the hair, nails, and cutaneous glands, also known as appendages. So uh, the hair and the nails, they have uh, this composition of dead keratinocytes, and uh, they make a pliable soft keratin uh, that it is uh, found within these structures. Now, <clears throat> compact hard keratin Keratin will make up the hair and the nails and is tougher and more compact due to numerous cross linkages between the keratin molecules. This is uh, an electron view of the hair shaft and the keratinocytes. So this uh, hair shaft is made out of these individual keratinocytes. So we have different types of hair, um, and the name of the hair, it is pilus for just sing a single hair, and pili for uh, plural. Now the hair, uh, it's a filament of these dead keratinocytes that grow from the hair follicle, that it is deep within the skin. And we have hair almost everywhere in our body. Areas where we don't have the skin will be the palms, the soles, and <clears throat> the lateral surfaces of the fingers and the toes. Also, we don't have within the lips, the nipples, and parts of the genitals, like in the case of the females within the labia minora. Now, uh, there is different density of hair of people depending on their genetics but we can have a range between 55 to 70 hairs per square centimeter. And within the face, we have uh, 10 times as many. Now, uh, within the scalp, we have around 100,000 hairs. And there are difference, differences in hairiness across the individuals and genders just because uh, genetics and also because of hormones. Now, also, we have differences in texture and the pigment of the hair also because of genetics. So what are the types of hair? So we have fine hair that it is uh, developed before we born during fetal life in the last three months of development that is known as lanugo. This is very fine, short, uh, downy hair that it is unpigmented. And once we born, we lose it uh, usually uh, within the first week or so. And then this lanugo is going to be replaced by a fine pale hair that it is known as bilus. Uh, this bilus will form two thirds of the hair in women and one tenth of the hair of men. And all of the hair of children, it is bilus except the terminal hair that the children will have in the eyebrows, eyelashes, and the hair of the scalp. And by the way, so that third type of hair is the terminal hair. This is a long coarse hair 
that it has uh, more uh, pigmentation than the rest of the hair that we have and will form uh, in the eyebrow area, the, uh, it will form the eyelashes and also the hair of the scalp. And once we reach puberty, we will develop terminal hair in the pubic area and also in the axilla. And if uh, the male has genetics for it, the male will develop facial hair in the mustache area and also in the beard and as well in the trunk and in the limbs. So uh, we have uh, three zones of our skin along our length uh, the, of, the, of the hair. So uh, the most deep part will be the bulb, which is where the hair originates. And it is found within the dermis or the hypodermis sometimes. And only living hair cells are in or near the bulb. Now we have this other area, the second area next to the bulb that is called the root that it's under the skin. And this will be located, of course, within the dermis and the epidermis. And the visible hair will be the shaft or the hair that is found above the skin surface. Now, within the dermal papilla, we have a lot of connective tissue that has a lot of blood supply. And this will be the source of nutrition for the hair. Now there is this region of uh, the hair that is called the matrix. In this matrix, we have these stem cells that are mitotically active that helps to form uh, this elongation of the hair when the, the hair is growing. So this is the parts of the, of the hair. So this will be the hair bulb this will be the matrix. This will be the root underneath the skin. And then above the skin, this will be the shaft. And this is what you can see if you magnify this area with the microscope. So this will be the matrix. This will be the bulb itself. And this will be the dermal papillae, where we have these uh, mitotically active cells that makes this hair to grow. If you make a cross section of the hair, you will find from inner to outer three regions. The most inner one will be the medulla, which is made out of loosely arranged cells in air spaces. And then we have the next layer, which will be the cortex, which makes the much thicker layer of the hair. And this will consist of elongated keratinized cells. And then lastly, the outer layer will be the cuticle that it is made by multiple layers of thin scaly cells that overlap one to another, looking like if they were shingles and they have the free edges directed upward. Now the follicle, it is this diagonal tube that sometimes can go as deep as into the hypodermis and it has these two parts. So it has the epidermal root sheet, which is an extension of the epidermis that it is next to the hair root. This will uh, widen at the deep end into bulge and then it is the source of the stem cells for the hair follicle growth. And then we have this other layer that is called the root sheet, connective tissue, root sheet. And this is from the dermis, but it is a bit denser and it surrounds the epithelial root sheet protecting it. Now, <clears throat> within the outer part of the root, we have this series of nerves that are called hair receptors. And these hair receptors will sense the movement of the, of the hair root as the shaft is moving because uh, there is this touch to the skin or when the hair is, uh, sorry, the air is blowing above the surface of the skin, you can detect 
not only the direction of the wind but also the intensity because you stimulate these nerves these hair receptors to send a signal into our brain now also within the root of the hair we have this muscle associated into it that is called erector pili or piloerector muscle this is a smooth muscle that it is under the influence of the autonomic nervous system and it will be uh, contracting and make the hair shaft to stand creating as well as goosebumps and this will be happening under different stimuli like uh, cold uh, when some someone is scared etc so this is a high magnification of the hair follicle so this is the matrix this is the internal root sheet or the epidermal root sheet and this will be the external root sheet which is part of the epidermal root sheet and then this will be the connective uh, tissue sheet and this will be a glazing membrane in here and of course this is again the dermal papilla so this is a, a medium magnification to show you the uh, medulla the cortex and the cuticle in a longitudinal cut the texture of this uh, of the hair and the color varies uh, and this is usually uh, due to genetics and of course to aging so if someone has a straight hair in a cross section the hair will be round if someone has wavy hair the uh, cross section will show oval shape and curly hair is relatively flat now uh, the color will be according to how much melanin the person will have and what type of melanin so if someone has brown and black hair the person has a lot of eumelanin if someone has red hair the person has a lot of pheomelanin if someone has blonde hair you'll have an intermediate amount of pheomelanin and very little eumelanin and then when someone has gray hair or white hair the person either doesn't have melanin or has very little and it might have air present within the medulla so this is uh, then the picture to show you or the figure uh, the differences in hair so straight hair uh, it's round in a cross section wavy it's uh, oval and then flat and curly now gray hair it has air space and oval uh, medulla and then uh, someone who has red hair the person will have a lot of pheomelanin and very little eumelanin. Someone with black or brown hair will have a lot of eumelanin, very little pheomelanin. And then someone who has uh, blonde hair will have intermediate amount of uh, eumelanin and pheomelanin, but will have more pheomelanin than eumelanin. Now our hair grows in different cycles uh, and they are called anagen for the most active cycle which can last from uh, six to eight years so it's also known as the growing phase in this phase uh, which is when 90 percent of the scalp follicles are found at a given time the stem cells start mu multiplying in the <coughs> sorry in the matrix and then the follicle will grow deeper into the dermis and then the hair uh, cells in the matrix will keep multiplying and then they will start to keratinize and then that will cause the hair to grow upward and the old hair that is called the club hair will uh, persist temporarily alongside and finally will be shed now in the uh, degeneration phase which is called the catagen phase which lasts between two to three weeks your hair growth will cease 
uh, and the hair bulb will start keratinizing and it will move up uh, closer into the papillary dermis and it will form club hair and then the lower follicle that it grew during the antigen phase will degenerate. And then as you are brushing your hair, this uh, club hair or all hair will be easily pulled out. Now the last phase, which is the resting phase uh, that lasts between one to three months, the dermal papillae has ascended. And then the club hair will fall out usually intelligent or the next antigen phase. So this is uh, what happens. So first you have this growth of the cells making this hair bulb to go down sometimes up to here into the uh, hypodermis following uh, the blood vessels just to get more nutrients. And then the hair will start growing because you have increased uh, mitosis in the hair matrix and then the cells will start keratinizing and then the old club hair will uh, shed out and then uh, you will have the catagen phase in which the club hair will detach from the matrix which is found somewhere in here and then you will have degenerative uh, part of this lower follicle and finally during this resting phase the dermal papilla has ascended up to the level of the bulge which will be here and then the club hair will fall out and then uh, you start the cycle again. So we lose a lot of hair between 50 to 100 hairs daily, daily. and uh, at some point our hair will grow little by little to replace these uh, hairs that we have lost. Uh, we have a growth of an average of one millimeter every three days. And uh, sometimes as we age and because of genetics, you can have lack of thick hair in certain areas. This is known as alopecia. And uh, depending on that area, it is... Uh, called differently but at some point all is about genetics now alopecia it's more a problem of males and this uh, alopecia is inherited by a dominant gene so a male uh, when he has this dominant gene will have alopecia and it will be expressed when testosterone levels are high and then testosterone will cause the terminal hairs on the top of the scalp to be replaced by bilious hair. Now sometimes also you can have overgrowth of uh, hair in females that it is known as hirsutism and this can be related to hormonal problems as well. So what are the functions of the hair? Well the hairs uh, help to at some point protect areas of our body like we have vibrisse within the nostrils or the nose and also in the ear canals that helps trap these uh, particles. Also the terminal hairs like the eyelashes in our eyebrows help us to protect our eyes and the uh, scalp will retain heat and protects against sunburn. So it has different uh, functions. Now let's talk about the nails. So the nails uh, are found within our fingers or within our toes and they are derivatives of the stratum corneum. Now the, the nails are composed of dead cells so that's why when we cut our, our nails we don't feel any pain. But, well if you cut it carefully, but you have to uh, make sure that you don't damage the part of the of the nails that makes the nails to grow. Now <clears throat> functions of the nails will be for improved grooming to pick up uh, pieces of food or to manipulate our environment. Also will help to protect our fingertips. Uh, if we didn't have our nails and if we uh, 
uh, touch directly some objects that are sharp, etc. Uh, we might cut ourselves really easily. And it also provides certain sensitivity. Now the nails have uh, different parts. So we have a major part that is called the nail plate, which is made out of three subparts. So it has a free edge, which is the one that we cut uh, when we cut our uh, nails. So this will be the overhang that is found at the tip of our fingers or toes. And then the bolt, which will be the nail body, which is the part that is visibly attached uh, to the underlying tissue. And then we have an invisible part that it is under the skin that is called the nail root. So these are the different parts of the nail plate. So this is the nail root under the skin. This will be the nail body, the bulk, and then this will be the free edge. And all of these three parts together are called the nail plate. And then the part of the skin that is under the nail root is called the nail fold. And then there is this tiny part of skin that attaches into the first part of the body, which is called the lunule or cuticle, sorry, the uh, eponychium. Now, <clears throat> this part of the skin that it's under the nail plate is called the nail bed. And in here we have a lot of capillaries that are useful for us to see if someone uh, has lack of oxygenation or not, especially of course if you have a pulse oximeter, which is a device that you can connect and then uh, you can detect the levels of oxygenation. And then this extension of the nail bed underneath the nail fold is called the nail matrix. So this is where we have the cells that starts uh, growing and then they make the nails to grow as well. And then on the sides, we have the nail groove and then the nail fold. So what is the nail fold? It's the surrounding skin rising above the nail. Nail groove is the area that separates the nail fold from the nail plate. Nail bed is the skin under the nail plate. And the specific name of the nail bed is called hyponychium which is the epidermis of the nail bed. And then the matrix, nail matrix is the zone where you have the mitotically active cells of stratum basale. And these cells, as they are growing, makes our nails to grow one millimeter per week. And it's slower in the toenails. And then there is this uh, white opaque area that is in different uh, lengths in different people that is called uh, that is by the nail root that is called the lunule and this is uh, part of the nail matrix now the eponychium or cuticle will be the zone of the dead skin that overhangs the proximal end of the nails and protects our nails Okay, now let's talk about the cutaneous glands. So we have uh, different uh, cutaneous glands. So we have sweat glands, sebaceous glands, ceruminous glands, and mammary glands. So sweat glands are also known as sudoriferous glands, and uh, they are subdivided into apocrine and merocrine. So the merocrine glands are sweat glands that function in the ever evaporative cooling and these are distributed in many places of our body including the um, back uh, of our body the front of our body basically they are located everywhere and the apocrine sweat glands uh, they have a very scars distribution so we have it in the pubic area axillary area in the male's uh, facial hair and these uh, apocrine glands they serve as sweat glands but also an ascent gland and the sweat glands of apocrine type are inactive until puberty and sometimes they produce these 
sweat that is milky and contains these fatty acids and they are released when someone is, is under stress or sexual stimulation and uh, some people believe that they secrete feral hormones because these chemicals can influence the behavior of others. Now, sometimes when these uh, fatty acids get combined with uh, bacteria that we have in our skin, it can produce this disagreeable odor that is called bronchhydrosis. So another name for the mercury glands is eccrine glands. And this will be, as I told you before, this real throughout our body, we have between three to four million in the skin of adults. And uh, sorry, I mentioned before that we didn't have in thick skin, but we do have it. We have it in the uh, palms very uh, abundantly and also in our soles and in the forehead. So these are the areas where we sweat the most. And these are composed of tubular glands that are simple. And these will be the glands that produces the perspiration and uh, they are sometimes associated with myoepithelial cells that will contract. So these are contractile cells that will contract under the influence of the sympathetic nervous system. So when you are scared, you tend to sweat the most because you activate a nervous branch uh, that is called the sympathetic system. And uh, then this will help to squeeze perspiration up to the duct. Now, the sweat glands uh, begin their uh, production of sweat as a protein-free filtrate of blood plasma. So you filtrate the blood plasma, and then you start uh, increasing the amount of sodium chloride and other solutes if you have them in excess in your body. And then if you have drugs within your body, you can screen also through this filtration and the sweat itself is 99% water. The pH is uh, acidic, so we have between 4 to 6%. So this will help to uh, inhibit bacterial growth because bacteria don't grow on acidic pH very likely. And uh, we tend to perspirate be, like around half a liter of day. And this doesn't produce visibly wetness of skin. Now, if someone is uh, profusely sweating, this is known as diaphoresis, and this may be the result usually of exercise, and the person can lose up to one liter of sweat per day, I'm sorry, per hour, and then of course the person has to replace these fluids with water. Now, we have also sebaceous glands that produces uh, an oily secretion that is known as sebum, and they release this uh, sebum by holocrine secretion. So when these cells accumulate a lot of sebum inside their cytoplasm, they burst. So this is the holocrine secretion. And then the shape of these cells will be uh, like a flask, and they have a short duct opening into the hair follicles. Now the function of this uh, will be to secrete this oil into our skin so that it will not overdry our skin. The other types of glands that we have in our skin will be the ceruminous glands. So the ceruminous glands are coil, they are simple tubular glands, and they're found only in our external ear canal, so basically in our ears. And these are modified apocrine glands. So they have this secretion that combines sebum and dead epithelial cells, and they form this earwax that we know as cerumen. The function of this uh, cerumen is to kill bacteria, to waterproof this canal, and to keep the eardrum uh, uh, at some point uh, not over drying, so make it pliable. So uh, the, within this cerumen, you have also acidic uh, components that helps to kill the bacteria, and then makes uh, guard hairs of ear sticky to help block foreign particles from entering into the auditory canal. The other type of glands that we have within the integumentary system will be the mammary glands. Uh, the mammary glands in females help to produce milk 
to uh, lactate uh, to produce milk for the baby. And these are modified apocrine glands. Now, when they secrete this milk, they secrete it at this duct opening at the nipple. And then within the mammary glands, we have these mammary ridges or milk lines, which are two rows of mammary glands in most mammals. Now, these mammary ridges or milk lines, as they are forming, they only keep two glands in uh, humans. And if someone has an additional nipple along the milk line, this will be called polythelia. So those are the uh, structures of the integumentary system. Now let's talk about some problems of the integumentary system like skin cancer. Uh, skin cancer, uh, the mo majority of the causes uh, or cause for skin cancer will be to exposure to UV light. And this uh, exposure to UV light will create mutations in the DNA, especially uh, formation of uh, what we call thymine dimers. So remember, adenine has to bind to thymine. So when you expose so much to UV light, what you ha uh, end up doing to your DNA is that you break these uh, bonds between the strands of DNA and then you have repair. And then instead of uh, putting another adenine, you put a thymine and then they connect to each other and you put two thymines together. This is called a thymine dimer. Now the skin cancer often affects areas where that we expose most to the uh, UV light, like the head, neck, hands, lips, uh, etc., the ears as well. And it is most common in fair-skinned people because they have less uh, melanin and also it is found uh, in the elderly. Now, this is one of the most common and treatable cancers that they are. The only thing is that you have to detect it earlier because early detection uh, leads to higher survival rate. And then we have uh, three different types of cancer in the skin with other subtypes. Uh, we have uh, basal cell carcinoma, we have squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant uh, melanoma. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer. And this one is uh, unlikely to invade or metastasize. Uh, if it's uh, catch early, uh, it's, it has a good prognosis and it will form from cells of the stratum basale and the lesions usually are small, it looks like a little bump with a central depression and beaded edges as you can see there. Now squamous cell carcinoma, it's uh, rising from the stratum espinosum and of course we have there the keratinocytes. And these lesions appear in areas that it are very likely exposed to the environment, like the scalp, the ears, lower lip, or the back of the hand. These lesions have a raised edge, like you can see here. It has a reddened uh, central area, like an ulcer. And then uh, this Squamous cells carcinoma tends to metastasize to lymph nodes and become lethal. But if you have early detection and you remove it through surgery, you will have uh, less likelihood to have uh, problems. Now, malignant melanoma. So this arises from uh, melanocytes. This is the less common type of skin cancer, but it's the most deadly form because it tends to metastasize very easily. Uh, it forms really, uh, it forms frequently from NIVI. And the person when he has NIVI, they have to check so much for changes in the shape, the size, because if they don't check it for that, Usually by the time that uh, the person check and see a difference, very likely this one has metastasized. So it's one of the ones that metastasize early or invade early. This one has a risk factor of being found within families and it has highest incident in men 
uh, people with fair skin, and people who have had uh, severe burns as a child. Okay, now for burns. So uh, burns are the leading cause of accidental death. Uh, it can happen in many places and by many causes, including fires, kitchen spills, uh, exposure to sunlight, ionizing radiation, exposure to chemicals like strong acids or bases, and electrical shock. Now the deaths results primarily in the most uh, severe burn uh, or when the burn extends through a major region of our body and it results because someone loses a lot of fluids so it undergoes this uh, hypotension and then uh, cardiac shock and then the person very likely since he has lost the skin which is a barrier become infected and then the person will have uh, scars or formation of scar tissue or dead tissue. And then uh, if you want to remove this, uh, the, the scar tissue, this is called de debridation. Now, uh, burns can be classified according to severity into first, second, and third degrees. If the burn only involves the skin, uh, the epidermis. This will be called the first degree. The person will have uh, redness, po possibly is going to have a little inflammation of the skin, and it's going to have pain. And this will heal within days. So this is when someone overexposes itself into uh, sun. Now the second degree burn is called partial thickness because it goes as deep as into the dermis. The person then will have uh, redness as well in their skin. It can have tan or white skin, but it will have blisters and this is painful. And it can take up to several months for the person to heal and it can leave scars. Now, since it involves the dermis, this type of uh, the, uh, burn can lead to detachment of hair follicles. So when then you are debrid, uh, debrid, undergoing uh, debridization of these second degree burns, and if you're cleaning, and if you see that you are pulling hair follicles, this is a second degree burn. Now, in third degree burn, it's called full thickness because it involves the epidermis, all the dermis, and sometimes it can go up to bone, as deep as there. Often it will require skin graft, and the person loses a lot of fluid. This needs to be treated in the hospital, or at second degree sometimes, but third degree for sure in the hospital, and they have to have infection control because this person very likely uh, will have an infection and then you can have supplemental nutrition supplemental fluids of course and then the person can die very easily now at some point in this third degree burn the person might not feel pain why because he has uh, destroyed even the, the dermis and the person has destroyed the nerves that we have for pain so this is how it looks first degree only up to here second degree up to here so you can have blisters as you can see here and third degree is complete thickness okay so lastly uh, uv rays and sunscreen so we have two types of uv rays uva and uvb uva it has uh, less uh, wavelength or well it has a greater wavelength than UVB so it has less penetration and uh, they are improperly called uh, tanning rays or burning rays uh, tanning rays are called UVA burning rays are UVB mm -hmm. now both it seems like for us not harmful that UVA looks like both appears to initiate skin cancer so there is no such thing as a healthy tan with UVA. And uh, when it comes to sunscreens, 
sunscreens uh, don't protect 100% for as high as the number as it is. Sometimes high solar protecting factor or SPF can give a false sense of security. So uh, it seems like SPF 30 protects up to 97% from UVA and UVB and SPF 15 protects up to 94%. So you see there's only only 3% of difference, but there is no 100%. And uh, according to your book, some chemicals in the sunscreen can damage uh, DNA like uh, zinc oxide and can generate harmful free radicals. So uh, no matter what, it's always good to protect our skin uh, with these uh, sunscreens. Uh, just do some research and of course uh, when the when you are exposed to uh, sunlight of course protect yourself with clothing uh, drink plenty of fluids and try to expose yourself as minimum as as you need it but remember uh, UV uh, light also is important for the generation of vitamin D in your skin so it's not as harmful as it sounds to be exposed to UV light as well. So anyway, so this is the end of this uh, chapter. Hopefully uh, you uh, enjoy it. I mean, here tells you just the options for uh, skin grafts. So uh, just to finalize here. So when someone has a third degree burn, the person will require skin graft. And if the skin graft come from uh, the same person, but from other part of its body, it's called the autograft. These will have less chances of rejection than uh, any other of the graft that one person can have. It's called isograft if that graft comes from an identical twin. It can, it, it's called homograft or allograft is if it's come from unrelated person and as well it can come from even another species, uh, an animal. So in this case it's called heterograph or xenograft. So these uh, grafts are temporary and uh, they are more likely to have immune system rejection and sometimes they can even have amnion tissue and uh, artificial skin. So again, uh, this is all. Hopefully you have enjoyed this chapter. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Have a good day or have a good night. Bye-bye.